it's my great pleasure. Uh, I, I'm John Moreau, my co-host Karen Cameron, sorry, from Glasgow Uni. It's my great pleasure to, to introduce our speaker today, Professor John Lloyd from the University of Manchester, who probably needs no introduction, but um, well, here it goes for what it's worth. Uh, John's a professor of geomicrobiology and the director of the Williamson Research Center for Molecular Environmental Science at UMAN. Um, and he's also a senior visiting fellow at the National Nuclear Laboratory, as well as our incoming president of the Mineralogical Society for Great Britain and Ireland. Um, John's worked for a long time on microbial metal reduction and mechanisms um, and the microbial physiology for that, for metal reduction. And he's published a heap of papers, more than 250 papers in high profile journals. Um, his career, I think, has uh, has inspired many geomicrobiologists, including my, myself, and I'm glad to know John more recently as a, as a new friend, and uh, I think, dare to say, sometime unwitting mentor in this, in our profession. So uh, John has received many awards and honors, and uh, including the, the 2006 Geological Society of London Bigsby Medal, 2018 Schlumberger Medal of the Mineralogical Society of Great Britain and Ireland, in 2014, he was cited as one of the UK's top 100 practicing scientists. And in the, uh, from 2010 to 14, he was a Royal Society Industrial Fellow. More recently, 2015 to 2020, he was a, uh, awarded a Royal Society Wolfson Fellowship. And today um, he'll be talking to us about his, uh, his work in the subsurface microbiome. And we're quite excited to have him here with us today. Uh, so just before I turn over to you, John, I'll just remind everyone that we'll be recording today's lecture. Um, so if you'd like to keep your, your cameras and microphones off, uh, please do so. And I'm um, happy to take questions in the chat or afterwards. So without anything further from me, thank you very much. And we'll, we'll turn it over to Professor John Lloyd. Well, th th thanks, John. Th thanks so much for those, those, those really kind words. And uh, yeah, th thanks to you. And um, and, and Karen for organising these as well. I think I think they've they've, uh, they've been a fantastic um, distraction and resource for for many of us through lockdown, and it's kept a lot of people going. So thanks thanks for doing that. And it, look, looking at the, the the names and faces from um, uh, outside the UK as well, I think it's it's been a great outreach tool to you know um, reach out to, 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 to people from outside these shores. So, so, uh, so thanks for that. And, and also for Minsop for, for hosting things. Um, right, so I, I need to share some slides. Let's uh, get these up and running. Okay, so we've had the, the, the title advertised. So going underground, um, those of you who, 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 who know me well enough will know that we've had a long interest in uh, subsurface microbiology. Um, uh, uh, we've uh, been looking at a range of different uh, topics in that uh, in that area, uh, and a lot of that links into sustainability. So that's that's the sort of focus that I'd like to try and develop in the lecture today. So I was going to start off. I know you're not all subsurface microbiologists. Um, so a quick introduction, um, I hope not too patronising to, to, to most of you on uh, microbes in the subsurface. Uh, and, and then it, just reminding us why um, the subsurface is, is important, um, in particular in this case for reaching our net zero uh, carbon emission targets. Uh, that, so that's really a review of uh, recent literature, um, just to get us all up to speed. Before I talk about some of the work that we've been involved with uh, in Manchester, working with, with, with many other collaborating groups around water quality, nuclear waste management, bioremediation, circular economy, uh, metal processing and, and e-tech elements, all of which I think feed into some degree to this sort of net zero drive that we, we're all uh, pushing for now. And then I, there's a bit of a rallying call at the end. I'd, I'd like to just share some information with you all about the opportunities. It's a great time to get into this area. Um, we've got lots of techniques that are coming online that are available and there's a lot of interest by various stakeholders regulators government to support work in this area uh, and uh, and there's a lot of resources as well um, which i'll talk about uh, around the subsurface which which i think we should all engage with so i i thought i'd start with a nice picture as well i often use this in, in my undergraduate teaching just just to remind us of what we're studying you know this, this fantastic a uh, complex system 
that's driven by biology. I mean, it, it looks like this, and we, we can live here because of uh, microbial processes. Uh, and I, I, I always like to remember as well that the, the biosphere is actually just a very thin rind around this, this gigantic planet of ours. But in that thin rind, and we're probably going about five kilometers in, in depth, uh, and including, of course, the, the lithosphere, hydrosphere, and the lower portion of the atmosphere. But it's a very thin rind with, with tremendous diversity, uh, particularly around microbes that have fascinating physiology. Uh, and, and the organisms have such metabolic diversity that they can drive all the biogeochemical cycles that we're familiar with. So really understanding the Earth system is, is, is something that we're all very interested in. And, and I think, you know, going from a nano and micron scale understanding of these processes and the organisms that drive them, even down to sort of five kilometer depths is, is, a, is a really, really uh, important goal for all of us. And that links into global um, processes. So a brief history of uh, the subsurface. Uh, I mean, many people have studied the shallow subsurface for decades. Uh, and, and I guess over the last sort of 30, 40 years, people have been going much deeper to try to understand uh, the deep biosphere. Uh, and we've had a, a rich tradition of that in the UK. I mean, John Parks, who many of you will know, uh, recently retired um, from the University of Cardiff, previously working in Bristol, um, published some fantastic work uh, in this area, including the seminal paper in the, uh, in the mid nineties, looking at um, the deep bacterial biosphere and Pacific Ocean sediments and showing um, that you could, you could pick up microbial life at, at significant abundance uh, kilometers below um, the, the surface of the uh, Pacific Ocean and down you know, more than a kilometer into, uh, into, into the sediments below. Um, about that time, people were putting together inventories on uh, biomass and activities on the planet. Uh, and I think this is another seminal paper that many of us are familiar with uh, and, and it's changed the way many people thought and, and, and I think you know the thoughts in this review still uh, are still very very current uh, so you know coining the phrase the unseen majority the, the realization that microbial processes are, are incredibly important they're, they're not often obvious uh, but they do have critical roles in controlling the chemistry of the planet and, and they also do contribute um, significant amounts of carbon and biomass into into the biosphere even at depth and I, this has been revisited for many years. I mean, I, I, I know the numbers in the, the Whitman paper that I've just shown you are, are often um, uh, revised and challenged. And, and this is probably one of the most recent uh, updates, in, again, in PNAS. Um, and I think this, this, this you know, has gave a really nice picture, not, not just on sort of, you know, reframing some of those numbers, but, but also sort of highlighting, if you go down into the bottom panel here, you know, when you get down into the deep subsurface in particular, there's a huge reservoir of bacteria in archaea, um, obviously in the um, terrestrial and marine systems as well, but a huge amount of biomass that we, in all honesty, know very little about. Um, if we move on to the next slide, I mean, a lot of this information has come from marine systems, but, you know, we, we really need to understand the, you know, the continental subsurface much better as well, um, particularly given some of the, the things that I'll talk about uh, with regard to our drive to net zero. The subsurface is gonna be very important for us in the next uh, coming decades if we, we wanna drop our carbon emissions. So this is a lovely review, which I think pulls together a lot of the research uh, in, on the, the continental uh, drilling site shown in this figure here. Um, again, some of the numbers are revised. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd refer you to the, the review uh, to read it yourselves. It's, 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 it's a very elegant piece of work. But there are some significant gaps that are highlighted. So, you know, there's a, a clear lack of detail around the carbon cycle at depth. Uh, there's significant questions about the energy sources, the turnover rates. Uh, you, know, you know, is hydrogen an important uh, driving force from a range of uh, geological and chemical reactions, serpentinization, water radiolysis, for example. The genome sequencing initiatives on, on deep subsurface samples are, are showing a, an incredible amount of diversity and hinting at syntrophy, role for fungi and viruses. 
And all of those things need fleshing out. And so there's a lot of fundamental questions about subsurface, but there are also applied questions as well. And that's what I'm going to move to um, in a minute. And I, would, I, I was looking at the, the, uh, the, the plan for the, uh, uh, the, the seminars are coming up and there's some fantastic ones coming up. And I, one, of, uh, one of them that's coming up for James Bradley, I think, will pick up some of the themes around uh, energy and the subsurface. So I, I don't want to say any more uh, about that at the moment, but I'll just flag James's talk. So I think if you're interested in this area, you'll, you'll find that fascinating. He's going to do some excellent work in the area. Okay, so let, let's talk about applications and, and, and why this is important. So if you go to the 2019 report from the Committee on Climate Change, um, there's a, a bold ambition to have the UK net zero um, by 2050. And, then, and some cities are, are driving to do that quicker, which, which is uh, you know, the right thing to do, highly laudable. Um, now, if we're gonna meet those objectives, we're gonna need to use the subsurface to deal with disposal of industrial wastes, energy storage, extraction of valuable minerals, um, particularly for ETEC elements. Uh, but we've also got to bear in mind the subsurface is is important for other reasons. We, for example, we we get thirty percent of our water in, in England from aquifer stocks, and if something goes wrong down there during these applications, then that that could have devastating impacts. And we'll give you examples of that um, in a few moments. So, so it's a really really important area for many reasons. The enabling technologies, I mean, underground. Uh, carbon capture and storage is, is, is something I think is going to be very important um, and there's a lot of debate about that but, but people are certainly pushing forward with that in the UK with, with, with good reason. Um, energy storage, so um, whether you're storing heat, methane or hydrogen in the subsurface, yeah, particularly if you start putting things like methane and hydrogen in the subsurface, that, that's the excellent energy sources for microbial metabolism so that, that will undoubtedly have biological consequences that need to be quantified and understood. Uh, even things like geothermal energy abstraction, but, you know, the, the, there's, there's potential um, biology around some of the infrastructure needed for, uh, you know, for, the, for that sort of application. Um, and uh, an impact on water chemistry that, that could be promoted as well. Uh, if we want to have net zero, we, we've got to have a role for nuclear going forward, certainly in, in the next, next uh, few decades. And that's not going to happen unless there's confidence that we can deal with our nuclear legacy and that involves a safe, deep disposal of nuclear waste, which is UK policy and policy for um, all um, significant nuclear countries worldwide. Uh, and then, of course, you know, if you want to go into the subsurface to get things out, and that, that could be fracking for non-conventional gases, it doesn't look like that'll happen in the UK anytime soon, um, but it, it is happening in other parts of the world. Uh, and, and maybe for in situ mining, if you want to get it reserved, you might not want a, a traditional mine. You might want to do, uh, you know, in situ mining using fracking type technologies to get at the metals uh, deep underground. So, again, the, the, there's microbiology there that's probably going to be very important. So, so I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a new frontier. We're at a, you know, a, a critical time in developing these technologies, and and we've got to make sure that geomicrobiology is is uh, is embedded in those plans because they could have a dramatic impact on the performance of some of these technologies. And this uh, from a, a, a recent review um, from Kabu Patel, I, I think gives a nice indication of the range of depths that we could be looking at. So, you know, that could include, uh, you know, the, the, the deep biosphere, if you're looking at, uh, you know, methane hydrogen storage, obviously hydrocarbon production, there's, there's been microbial, uh, uh, experts involved in that area for many years, um, but they, they haven't really started to work in, in, in these sorts of areas yet. Uh, and then if you go up to the sort of shallower um, subsurface, you've got um, you know geothermal systems, compressed air, energy storage, and of course, uh, groundwater um, resources that need protecting. So there's 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 you know there's there's a, a, a clear um, need to understand really what's going to happen around the processes here and in particular how microbes might be involved. So what could go wrong when we perturb the subsurface? So let's just stop and, and look to see if there are any clues from, from other processes, other times when we've changed 
groundwater hydrology and, and, and chemistry dramatically and what the impacts have been and the obvious one that jumps out to people uh, in the field is is the the problem around arsenic um, termed the largest mass poisoning in history um, so in the latter parts of the last um, last century there was a, a drive in, in southeast asia particularly bangladesh uh, initially to uh, go into the, the subsurface to collect water that was clean and pure uh, and not contaminated with surface pathogens, which, which um, was an issue with the, the water that was being used at the time. Um, and unfortunately, over the, uh, the decades following the installation of literally millions of these wells, it became obvious that there was a, an environmental catastrophe and, and arsenic was being mobilised into the drinking waters uh, and, and being taken up by the of the populations. Uh, it was originally picked up in um, you know, Bangladesh and, and Bengal, uh, but it's a it's a global problem. I mean, you look at the numbers here, this is a fairly old slide now from, from a review in the area, uh, but in Bangladesh, 50 million people at risk, uh, you know, India, at least a million. Um, other Asian countries, uh, an issue in, in Vietnam, Taiwan, China, Thailand, Nepal on this map. It's, it's a problem in parts of Europe. This, this map isn't exhaustive. There's lots of countries that are missing in areas where we you know, haven't even looked, to be honest, but you know, probably in North America and, and South America. So um, you can see why it's called the biggest mass poisoning in history, it literally tens to hundreds of millions of people impacted. And, and it's a, essentially a microbial problem, or, or certainly a you know, cause to the problem. Um, I mean, we, in, in the 2000s, there are many groups looking at this, and ourselves included, and we were lucky enough to get some samples of uh, sediment from a, an impacted area in Bengal. And we did some simple experiments, stimulated the, the sediments with, with carbon, in this case, using acetate as a, as a proxy for organic carbon. Uh, the microbes that we were particularly interested in were the metal reducers. So these are organisms that respire metals in the subsurface. They've been introduced in many of the other talks um, in this series. Um, so uh, you know, Sophie and Casey and others have talked about these at some length, but just as a refresh, they're um, oxidizing up organic matter. There's, they're, they're growing in anoxic environments and they're using the minerals, the iron bearing minerals, the Fe3 minerals as an electron acceptor to support growth. The reduction of the iron and, and also reduction of any absorbed arsenic five leads to release of metals and, and that's essentially what's causing the problem. And this fitted in very much with, with work that people like Charles Harvey uh, and, and others in the US were doing uh, to suggest that changes in the way that the water was being used, particularly through large scale removal of underground water uh, for irrigation and drinking water, was drawing down organic carbon to stimulate these organisms. Uh, I think people accept this is the mechanism that's driving it. There's still a lot of debate as to what the actual electron donor is, whether it's you know, organic carbon. I mean, methane's implicated now, uh, potentially even things like ammonium. Um, so I, the, the detail there still needs to be um, fleshed out and it's probably very much specific to particular sites and areas, but uh, it's, I think the, the acceptance is it's a microbial problem and it's, it's linked to big changes in the way that people were using the subsurface. So there's a warning there for us, I think. Make sure we know what we're doing before we um, proceed with these uh, these large large projects. Um, so other other issues that could could cause cause concern. So you know it, it's not just about you know protecting the in environment. It's also actually about protecting the infrastructure in these applications. So you could have degradation of the uh, the materials that are being used for these um, uh, these applications. So I mean, we've done a bit of work recently on, on sulfate um, reducing bacteria and other and fire sulfate reducers as well in, in fracking type systems with colleagues in America. And, and these organisms are persistent in these sorts of environments um, and, and, and they can cause problems. If you, obviously, if you start getting sulfide production, that, that'll promote corrosion. Uh, biofilm formation, um, also uh, potentially a, a, uh, an issue in these sorts of systems uh, could have a dramatic impact on the, the performance of the of, the, of these processes uh, and, and just to stress a lot of these organisms are there and, and they're pretty resilient as well and you've also of course got the potential to draw down organisms from uh, the surface who could cause problems as well 
so the, 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 there are things we need to be concerned about but you know the title is a bit more positive than that so let's let's try and understand how these microorganisms and processes could be useful because they could i mean broadly they could be very useful in attenuating a lot of these negative aspects if we understand the systems properly and, and, and harness them appropriately and control the problematic organisms through sort of targeted uh, approaches so how could subsurface geomicrobiology be of use so our, our interests um i i moved to manchester into 2001 and, and we've worked largely on on metal reduction throughout that time um, and the focus there has, has been on understanding the mechanisms of electron transfer flow in these systems i won't talk about that in too much detail um, we've worked a lot on the environmental impact in a range of um, different contexts and also biotechnological applications so what i'd like to do now is just just talk about some of the, the things that we've worked on and, uh, and try and uh, and give you uh, some, some some examples of how uh, subsurface microbiology could, could could actually be quite useful with these uh, uh, these uh, these applications. So there you go. That's the the iron reducing system again. So specialist microbes growing in the subsurface away from oxygen using iron minerals as an electron acceptor in place of oxygen, uh, and coupling the oxidation of uh, organic matter acetate we often use as a as a, a proxy for organic matter. It's a, a key intermediate in organic uh, matter degradation um, so that that's that's why it's on that slide but it could be a range of other electron donors including hydrogen uh, and the impacts um, can be can range from um, mobilizing metals we talked about arsenic and, and, and more soluble fe2 as well uh, immobilizing some other metals as well changing the mineral structure uh, and, and having a, a big impact on organics as well so uh, it's a simple process it's electron transfer at the cell surface but it, it has uh, a lot of uh, a lot of environmental implications okay so both organics and other metals can substitute as the electron donors and acceptors in these uh, in these simple systems so some pictures here just to give you a, a bit more of a flavor for the the uh, mineral microbe interface and how important it is in these are geobacter cultures this is a very commonly used iron reduced in the environments growing on a, an iron oxide film visualized using a range of um, AFM type systems. And you can see uh, here the, uh, you know, the mineral microbe interface is key and the, the organisms are pretty much you know, drilling down into that, that substrate as they, uh, as they respire the iron. Uh, there's a, another nice study here from um, Laura Newsom when she was working with us in Manchester and our colleagues over on the nano sims. Uh, so here the cultures growing on iron were fed with uh, C13 labeled acetic organisms that are in direct contact with the uh, iron mineral here shown in red were, oops, were able to um, uh, oxidize that labeled organic, incorporate it into their biomass as well. So that's why they're, they're lit up as, as green on this uh, slide. These other blue cells are the ones that haven't been in contact with the iron oxide. They can't oxidize the organic, so they haven't picked up that label. So you can visualize these organisms uh, at, the, at the nano scale using some quite advanced techniques nowadays. Um, this is just to emphasize that although they're iron reducers, they can also reduce manganese and a whole host of other metals. And uh, there's a range of different uh, metals that we've worked on from the transition metals out to the metalloids. Uh, and even these heavy elements in the nuclear context that we'll talk about uh, in, in, in a few slides time. So let's give you some case studies, some examples of why these sorts of systems are important. So the first one is looking at nuclear waste. And nuclear uh, is, is a, um, an energy source that is relatively low carbon and will be part of the, the drive towards net zero. Now, interestingly, uh, a lot of the organisms that reduce iron can also use the same electron transfer pathways to reduce uranium, which would be present in groundwater uh, as soluble uranium-6. And then the same processes for iron would lead to the reduction of soluble uranium-6 to insoluble uranium-4. And that's great because that allows you to immobilize and capture the uranium in the subsurface. 
Uh, there's loads of organisms that can do this. Uh, this is from a, a review that I'll show you in a minute, just to give you a, a feel for the, the broad range of organisms that, that are potentially involved in geobacters in that, that mix, as is Schuonella, another well-known organism, but, but many other uh, metal reducers as well. We, we've worked on a range of sites in the UK. The first one we worked on with Mike Wilkins when he was doing his PhD with us um, was, uh, was the Drig um, low level waste repository up in Cumbria. And this is a, a nice example of the, the sort of way that these microbial communities respond to carbon. Put a bit of carbon in um, oops, and you'll see under anaerobic conditions, the ingrowth of Fe2 and the uranium levels will plummet. Um, very quickly because it's getting reduced and precipitated and that's a, an enzymatic process driven by the same enzymes that are involved in, in iron reduction. This has been worked on at scale. Um, many of you will know the site. There's a, a, in particular a Colorado rifle site where an injection array was drilled by Phil Long and, and, and colleagues um, as part of uh, the DOE program to stimulate the subsurface and, and that acetate injection array was very um, uh, was very effective in stimulating metal reducers, which then immobilized uranium uh, at that site. If you want to look at some of the work that came out of that site, have a look at this review. There's some really, really impressive work done on that site. Okay. Our own site that we've worked on has been Sellafield in the UK. Um, you'll, you'll know of it, I'm sure, and you probably know a bit about the history. Uh, it was originally a munitions site in the 40s, and then it became nuclear, part of the nuclear program. Uh, and now it's the largest concentration of nuclear expertise in Europe. Um, and, and it's moved more towards waste management, storage and decommissioning. And that, there's, there's in excess of 10,000 people working there. It's gone from this small site here to this, this mega site um, on, on this slide here. There are areas of um, legacy waste that need dealing with including contaminated sediments and there's a lot of interest in using passive in situ biological processes such as uranium reduction to deal with these legacy issues. So to put some numbers on this I mean these are grand challenges for, for the UK and they're similar grand challenges for other countries worldwide. So you're looking for decommissioning that site more than 100 years at least 70 billion um, contaminated land includes 20 million you know, cubic metres. Now, if you can have cost savings on this complex site through using passive effective biological systems, then you will, you will save millions to billions. So there's a, a, a driver here to, to look at what could be done at site. Um, again, this was some work that Laura was doing in the group a few years ago uh, as part of a PhD, looking at the endpoint. So U4 could exist in, in several different forms. Initially, in my, my biological cultures, you tend to get uh, under certain conditions, these uh, poorly crystalline monomeric forms, but if you age them, they become more crystalline uh, uraninite type materials, which are a, a bit more stable. But we really wanted to try and make them even more stable against reoxidation. So um, early work here was done using glycerol phosphate as a, an electron donor to drive uranium reduction. Uh, and then the glycerol was used to do that and the phosphate was released uh, and would then lead to the uh, production of uranium-4 phosphate, which is very, very recalcitrant. So if you choose the right sort of electron donor mixes, you can make these systems quite robust and, um, and long-lived. Technetium is another element that, that um, you might not have heard too much about, but is, is an issue on site. It's quite mobile. Uh, you can see here the, uh, uh, the perimeter around the separations area and the, um, the technetium migrating off-site in the groundwater. Um, we, we knew quite early on that iron reducers are particularly good at immobilizing technetium. They can do it enzymatically, but if they make iron two bearing minerals, for example, extracellular magnetite in this slide here, that, um, that magnetite will reduce and immobilize the technetium very effectively. Here visualized using uh, a 99M, a, a gamma emitting version of technetium that's used in the hospital for, uh, for imaging purposes. And uh, we've used that to show how effective these reduced bio barriers that you can make by stimulating subsurface communities with carbon and then flowing the, the uh, contaminated solutions across and they're, they're very good at mopping up the, the technetium so i've got a i think this works actually um, this is uh, one of these processes running in real time so you've got some bio reduced columns on the left hand side 
packed full of FE2, that's reducing and precipitating that uh, mobile gamma emitting technetium 99M. And the oxid control, um, the, the technetium just moves through. So that, that shows how these systems can work at very low concentrations, environmentally relevant concentrations um, in, in, in real time. And, and other things that we've touched on have been trying to work with com commercial um, agents to stimulate metal reduction. So there's a range of new combined that have been designed for treating other metals and they're pretty good for these radionuclides and actually give you really stable endpoints where reduced radionuclides don't really re-oxidize and that's shown in these figures here from in the s &T paper. So you get reduction of the uh, technetium very efficiently uh, and then even when you re-oxidize the system the, the technetium stays in the, um, in the sediments. If you just use a simple organic acid to stimulate the, the reducers then that system isn't that stable and the technetium comes back out. Okay so we know that these systems can be really important in uh, reducing or minimizing the mobility of key radionuclides in the subsurface in shallow sediments. Um, what about doing, during deep geological disposal, which is the plan now for our UK waste? So what we're trying to do is extend this idea of a bio barrier that you can build. Uh, so instead of looking at that in the shallow subsurface, could that happen in the deep, um, the deep subsurface? Uh, and, and this is linked into the, um, uh, the need to move our radioactive waste deep into the subsurface for disposal. Uh, and this is government policy. Uh, this is being developed in the UK now at some pace. Uh, the idea here is that you would find a suitable geology. Uh, you would then uh, excavate a large cavern, put the waste, in this case, this is intermediate level waste, which is a, a, a significant burden in the UK, enough to fill several large football uh, several times, if you, if you want to try and picture the, the, the quantities we're talking about here. So a large engineered structure, big caverns, you put these waste materials, often organic rich, and containing a broad range of uh, materials, including radionuclides, into cement, then into steel drums, then into the cavern, you backfill that, uh, and then that system you need to be confident will stay stable for you know, hundreds of thousands of years while the radioactivity decays. Um, we became very interested in this area because we realized that over time, it's the, the barrier system that's implemented to grades, you'll have a, an alkaline plume that moves into the subsurface. And we know there are microbes there. So, so what does that mean? Well, we get um, microorganisms colonizing that, that alkaline plume and, and, and changing the chemistry of the system, perhaps in a good way. Uh, so early on, we wanted to understand the upper limit of microbial metabolism. We don't have a a, a geological disposal system or GDF to work with in the UK. So we, I live in the Peak District, so we went to a site on the edge of Buxton, which has been impacted by uh, highly alkaline wastes uh, from the lime workings uh, for, for many decades. So this is a great source of microbes for these experiments. And we were able to look at the upper limit for these anaerobic processes there, and it's hovering around 12. Um, and that kind of fits in with the thermodynamic calculations that you, you might make to suggest where the energy yields would, would start to diminish. Now those organisms growing at these high pH values, they, they can respire metals and actually magnetite stabilized at high pH. So uh, these these organisms, even at pH 10, 10 and a half, they, they very efficiently reduce the iron to, to make magnetite, which is a great scavenging agent for technetium, neptunium and, and other radionuclides. And the organisms themselves will also reduce uranium. So you've got a, a barrier system developing potentially that, that could mop up any of these priority radionuclides that are escaping from the geosphere um, and then into the potentially into the biosphere in, in the deep subsurface. Um, there's, there's a lot of papers that have been published on this from the group. I won't go through the detail, but the mechanisms are quite interesting and have some similarities to the uh, neutral pH subsurface systems that we studied at places like Sellafield, but some differences as well. For the microbiologists here, they tend to be driven by gram positives rather than gram negative organisms, but the mechanisms are broadly similar. So what are the electron donors? Well, as I mentioned, there's a lot of cellulose and, and other complex wastes go into these intermediate level um, packages. Um, and cellulose degradation products are particularly important. 
Uh, alkaline pH cellulose will degrade into a range of materials abiotically. Uh, and, and one of the um, compounds that's formed is something called ISA, which is a particular concern um, because it's a very strong complexant for radionuclides. And, and Najee Bacill and others in the group have worked a lot on this. It turns out it's actually a great substrate for these organisms and it can support a range of metabolisms, including iron and, uh, and metal reduction. Um, so Najee has the organisms out now and other groups have been working on these as well, Paul Humphreys and colleagues in, in Huddersfield, for example. Uh, and collectively, we're getting a much better view of how these organisms work, including in these some of these pure culture strains, the physiology and biochemistry involved, um, work that Nedge is doing at the moment. Gina Cooper's work, worked in the, the group as well recently, did her PhD with, um, with, with RWM, the sponsors for this work, and showed that ISA can support um, mineral transformations and the capture of, um, in this case, nickel, uh, linked to iron reduction products and also uh, products of sulfate production in these systems, so um, iron sulfides which could scavenge nickel, which is a, an activation uh, product that's of some concern in, in nuclear uh, waste uh, disposal. Okay, a question that often comes up is, well, it's going to be intensely radioactive down there, that, that's going to keep the biomass down. Actually, I'm not sure that's true. Um, Ashley Brown working the group did some really nice work to show that when you irradiate some of these systems, you actually get enhanced iron reduction. And that's probably because you're um, freeing up more organics and, and destabilizing some of the iron oxides and making them more bioavailable. And that's been followed up by other studies in the group where, for example, Najee's shown that you can really change the degradation fate of cellulose by irradiating it. And, uh, and that will stimulate microbial activities. Uh, and uh, and also Ash did some really nice work to show that you can start off with a, um, a crystalline form of iron that these organisms won't respire when you when it becomes irradiated you get defects and it becomes more bioavailable so you can prime both the organic and inorganic components of that reducing system to, to stimulate life. So on top of all these engineered barriers you know in time you're probably going to get a bio barrier and that needs to be quantified so that we can understand really what that looks like in a G GDF, Geological Disposal System Safety Case. Uh, and, and this is a, a book that we published from a, a large EU consortium uh, just a few months ago with a, a nice chapter on this biobarrier concept showing the, this, the plume that might form around the uh, repository, mopping up gases like hydrogen and methane that could be formed that cause concern, breaking down chelating agents and, and then ultimately immobilizing some of the radionuclides that people are very concerned about. So potentially good news in, in, in the subsurface for this system. Now the last case study that I'll spend probably about 10 minutes on before we break for some questions is something a little bit different. So uh, we know there's a lot of interesting organisms in the subsurface. We, we've worked extensively as have other groups on the iron reducers but there are other uh, organisms in there that are, are, are pretty much un, un, uh, uncharacterized. And uh, I think there's just a huge resource there for biotechnology, particularly when you marry um, those organisms up with synthetic biology approaches to engineer novel processes. Um, so one of the things we focused on is looking at the mineralogical endpoints of iron reduction and seeing how the things that you could form could be useful. So it could be a magnetic material like magnetite, which we've mentioned already, top right. Top left, you could have precious metals in there or platinum group metals. Um, and, you know, even things like quantum dots could be formed through, uh, you know, selenide uh, formation from uh, the reduction of selenium oxyanions. And those, those are incredibly useful for a range of high-tech applications. Uh, this is work that Vicky Coker and others have done in the group over, over many years, optimizing the conversion of something like ferrihydrite to magnetite and, and exploring the, the uses for that very fine grain magnetic material. That's included remediation agent for things like uh, chrome and technetium, driven by the Fe2 that's on the surface of the, um, of the magnetite and has a very potent um, activity against these metals. When they're reduced down, they become incorporated into the mineral phase and recalcitrance of reoxidation and release. Um, Matt Watts um, did some work with us several years ago for his PhD looking at how this could actually be used. 
there's a local link here to Glasgow for John and Karen. Um, Glasgow's built on quite a lot of uh, chromite ore material in some places, so very difficult street, high pH. Um, and, and this biomagnetite is actually a very good agent to, to clean up the sediments and, uh, at, at site. Um, we've looked at um, using these iron two berry minerals to treat organics, again, potentially useful in the subsurface. So nitrobenzene, PCE, very rapid degradation kinetics driven by the reducing power that's stored up in these reduced Fe2 bearing biominerals. Um, even uh, catalyst uh, applications, this, this case was using um, uh, magnetite based materials for um, increasing the, um, the value of low grade oils. Um, these systems are eminently scalable. So James Byrne, who many of you all know, was, did his PhD with Vicky and myself in the group looking at this um, with, with other colleagues. I, I think uh, Hal Beers, who also contributed to this work in the, in the, in the audience today. So some lovely work showing that you can scale these systems up. Um, the, the critical thing you, you've got to address really is you, it only really works if you're using waste materials. And uh, this was done with life cycle assessments with colleagues down in Surrey. Um, so this is really where this area should be going. Looking at waste materials, now you can revalorize them. And there was a nice paper a couple of years ago from uh, Marisha Joshi and others in the group uh, with our European partners uh, as well, looking at uh, using waste iron materials and, and converting them to magnetite for high value applications. And that's continuing with a, a really interesting EU project um, in the group at the moment with, with colleagues in mainland Europe looking at converting waste iron oxides that have been used to remove phosphate into uh, slow release iron uh, phosphate uh, fertilizers for poor quality soils. So again, it's all about revalorizing these wastes, that's the key. The other key is to, to try and make high value products as well, uh, and they have a high market value. Um, we've looked at a range of um, different metals. The one I'd like to highlight, that's probably the last example, uh, is something that Rick Kimball was doing in the group recently, and we're continuing with this work um, with, with, with a range of range of um, partners. Uh, and, and, and this focuses on copper. So uh, these organisms can reduce iron, a host of other metals that we talked about, including copper um, and Schuonella, a great model organism for these uh, metal reducers, is able to reduce copper 2 plus down to uh, these nanoparticles contained within the cell. They're copper one at the core with a, sorry, copper zero at the core with a, a, a copper one layer. And that copper one layer you can use for all sorts of catalytic applications, including click chemistry, which is the way that the pharmaceutical industry is, is, is heading for a range of, uh, you know, high value, um, you know, new uh, pharmaceuticals to, to, to treat a, a range of, um, a range of, uh, conditions so HIV anti-cancer antibacterial activities a lot of this being driven by this this very adaptable click chemistry which could be driven by microbes accessing waste copper that could be from a mining site um, the, the partner we've worked with most recently is, is the uh, whiskey distillery sites uh, this is with the uh, Shivas uh, up in Scotland again another Scottish link and there's quite a nice paper in green chemistry talking about that using both magnetite and the and the potentially the organisms themselves that make the magnetite to capture the, the copper and then um, basically revalue it so where's this going i mean more and more exotic metals these organisms from high oxidation state metals including uh, precious metals and platinum group metals so this was an early study using a, a, an innovation in TEM imaging, this is in a hydrated cell, which was amazing. So you can actually watch these um, minerals forming at the nano scale in, in real time, certainly in the submicron scale. And then if you really want very high definition maps, you pull a vacuum onto these samples and then look at them using more conventional electron microscopy. But this shows um, a, a nice mixed uh, a metal nanoparticle with both um, gold and palladium. It has some really interesting catalytic properties. And we've got a paper coming out on this and other hybrid materials with some industrial colleagues coming out very, very shortly. Um, and, and in the future, other metals. I mean, this, this has got to be a growth area. If we want to have a low carbon economy, if we want to have you know, wind turbines, electric cars, uh, a lot of e-tech innovations, we, we're desperately short of, and, we'll, and we will become, these will become limiting. A lot of the metals that are shown in this EU 
um, figure. These, these are the metals that were prioritized uh, in one of the science programs from the European Union. Um, and, and there's a lot of metals there that could be targeted by microbial metabolism and revalorized. So there's a huge amount of interest. Again, the UK got quite a lot of groups working on this uh, and there's a big driver and the, the research councils are supportive of this area. There's new centers around circular economy. So this is an area that I, I think is a really good one for people to get into. And it's, um, you know, the, the science is fascinating as well if you, if you like cross-disciplinary research. So I, I hope I've left a few minutes for questions. I'll, I'll just do a few wrap up conclusion points and then a little bit of plugging for some, some uh, sort of future opportunities. I hope I've convinced people that the subsurface contains an important reservoir of uncharted life. I think we all bought into that before this lecture anyway. Um, but I've highlighted a few of the questions and I think these will be picked up in later um, seminars. Uh, there's a big question about how the microbiome in the surface will respond to these perturbations that we've introduced uh, as, as important for hitting net zero. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there. And I think there's a lot of opportunities around mining the, uh, the genetic resource in the subsurface for, for innovation. And I've given you some examples of that already. Uh, it's a good time to get involved. Um, if you're interested in that metal area, look at the Metals in Biology uh, NIB, which is an industrial network there to link you in with industry. Um, and they will give you proof of concept funding if you can find a partner to work with and, and develop your ideas. So please, you know, look at the meetings that they hold as well. They're really good in this area. Uh, RWM are moving forward. They're the Rad Waste Disposal Agency uh, moving forward with uh, working with local communities on site selection. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities around microbiology as they accelerate their program to get, you know, the big hole in the ground dug and the nuclear waste down there. And there's a research support office based in Manchester with Sheffield's involvement, which can help with that. So look for RSO uh, on the Google search if you're interested in that area. And then for the other energy areas, UK Geos is, 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 is barreling forward with some really great opportunities. And I'll say some more about that in a moment. And for those outside the UK who might be listening to this, um, the scope for international collaborations, which I know we're all very keen on. And, and just to remind you, this is, the best time to be working in this area, not only is it important science, but you know, all the tools are falling into place. We've got tremendous innovations around omics and imaging and spectroscopy and modeling, coupled with sample availability. So, you know, the, and often the sampling programs, there's been a, a step change. A lot of them now are including protocols for handling the samples correctly in microbiology. So there's lots, lots there to work with. I just wanted to finish off by flagging the UK GEOS because there's a £30 million investment um, from the UK government into this. It's being managed very skillfully by the British Geological Survey. There's three observatories at the moment. Have a look on their website. The Glasgow one's up and running, and that's looking at heat recovery from flooded mine workings. And, and microbiologists are, are trying to understand how microbes are adapting and changing the system there. The Cardiff Observatory has, has come into this, um, this umbrella as well, looking at shallow geothermal. Uh, heat recovery and storage and again I think there are some micro microbial projects there at the moment and I'm sure there could be more and the Cheshire Observatory that's that's going ahead now that's the uh, the last one that they're, they're starting to uh, develop this year again looking at sort of energy storage around an energy corridor corridor in the uh, uh, in that part of Cheshire where there's a lot of industry uh, and there's a lot of opportunities there so have a look at those and, and, and if you're interested you should be able to integrate into those research programs Loads of people to thank. I mean, a long list of cross-disciplinary collaborators and researchers have contributed to this work and the funding. Um, the last slide I wanted to put up was just to emphasize how a lot of these things will be explored in later lectures. And I'm really looking forward to those. Um, and also Minstock, I think it's been a great home for the Geomicro Network and, and a special thanks to Kevin, who I know is here, who, um, uh, who uh, has been hugely supportive. And uh, I, I've taken over the president's role um, this month and, and I'll be in place for a couple of years. Uh, and one of the things I'd like to do, we, we have a sort of presidential meeting um, uh, every you know, with every presidential cycle. And in December, we'll be having one uh, around the micro mineral interface through time and space. So looking at how that's been involved in evolutionary processes all the way through to some of these applications that I've talked about today. So 
I hope people will come to that and you know and, and, and become involved in that meeting and we'll be advertising that very soon. So with that, I think that's all I've got that I wanted to say today. And I'm very happy to take some questions and stay behind a bit later as well, if that's if that's helpful, John. Great, thanks so much, John. That was a fantastic talk. Great recounting of the journey your group's been on through a lot of these these uh, these areas dealing with radionuclide remediation and metal micro metal interactions. And thank you for that that talk. Could we call it your inauguration speech? <laughs> As you're the incoming president. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that sounds great. <laughs> All right. So I'm um, happy to turn uh, over to the audience for, for questions. What are your questions, guys? And maybe Karen and I can take tag team watching the chat to make sure we try to pick up. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's one yeah. in the chat yep. or some coming through in the chat. Sure. Do um, all right. I'll try to field the first one out of the chat here. So let's see. Uh, John, um, any possible methods to, uh, to pre predict potential metals that could be the electronic scepters of microbes in the subsurface, I suppose? Um, uh, yeah, okay. I, I, hmm. I, I, su I suppose there's a two-pronged approach there, isn't there? I mean, one, one is to try to get much more information about the microbiology, you know, so so multi-omics analysis, including transcriptomics, seeing what processes are running. I mean, that, that's got to help. And I, I suppose a really detailed understanding of the, the geochemistry and mineralogy of the system as well. Um, it's challenging. I mean, it, <laughs> these systems are really complicated. And, and, and um, I think, you know, just looking at the arsenic area, that, that's, you know, you're looking sometimes at a trace metal that's there in relatively low concentrations against a very complicated background. So I think it's a really good question. And, and, and yeah. I think you, you probably want to throw a multidisciplinary approach to that to try to understand it. Thank you. I get the feeling that question is invo involves the idea of a metaomics, as you were su just uh, suggesting to try to predict uh, what the c capacities are for different microbes it like iron reducers. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, I think uh, Benjamin has a question that he's uh, wanting to ask. Hey, John, great talk. Um, when the question when I have relates to this revalorizing approach. It's revalorizing things demand, demands isolating it from. Yes. That usually means you got to be very specific. You got, you, you're trying to, there needs to be a high level of specificity to preferentially remove copper or whatever. Um, and the myriad examples you gave show how hard that actually is. Even just Geobacter does a whole bunch of things by itself. Um, how do you constrain the biological system so that you can target a single me metabolic process, for example, to isolate copper or to isolate uranium or what, the thing that you want in, in processes, which is really key to mining technology being applicable or to yeah. valorizing? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think to illustrate the complexity of the system, when you look at radionuclides, which is the, I guess, the area we've done most on, you know, there's a whole host of them that we've been interested in. And when, when we started the work, we thought there'd be a single reductase that, you know, did all of these things because the redox chemistry wasn't that different. But actually, it's a different enzyme every time. So, that, that gives some challenges, but I suppose that gives you the potential for specificity if you can find the particular enzyme. You know, I mean, Geobacter, for example, has, has tons of different cytochromes, plus other things, you know, I mean, if you, if you can find the one that's, that's dominant, if, if, if you do have a level of specificity. And we do seem to have that with some of the, some of the radionuclides, and maybe, maybe that gives you some hope for targeting a particular metal. You, you've also got, you know, quite a lot of stuff around synthetic biology that I guess you could apply. So specific transporters, you know, the, the people in that area are pretty good at understanding specificity for transporters and particularly for potentially for binding as well. So, you know, the sort of fast display systems and things like that, that I guess people could, could implement and couple them in. So I think they can be fine tuned to some degree. Um, I mean, the last thing I'd say is that actually sometimes you might not want that level of specificity. I, I, we've been, struck particularly with some of the precious metals how the single metals don't 
they're not always the best. You know, sometimes you want to combine them with other things, and, and that changes the catalytic properties quite dramatically. So we we have got a project where we're starting to question that at the moment and seeing what happens with real potentially with real sort of leachates that have got complex mixes and you know you might not get that pure product that you want but you might actually get something that is okay or even better than the the, the single metal systems um but you're right so i think it's a really good question I, I i don't think it's a straightforward you know answer i think you know the stuff that could be done around systems files if you want to fine tune it but i think you know sometimes you might actually want the mixed metals as well to be honest um john i have a question about actually your copper and the uh, click chemistry idea it's it's fascinating i hadn't really heard about that or thought about that before that's that's definitely an important emerging direction i just i wondered about what about the sort of the reverse have has your group thought about or worked on using um, nano catalysts, bio, bio nano catalysts to degrade emerging contaminants, pharmaceuticals and things like that? Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And I think that they're, they're, they're potentially pretty active against those. I think a, there'll be a lot of interest in that area, particularly when you start. The challenge, I guess, is sometimes you, if there, it's an environmental system, sometimes you have to put, you know, dose it with trace amounts of palladium and things like that, which if you're looking at, doing something on a contaminated land site the regulators are really not keen on putting extra things in um so <laughs> some of these conversations came up when we were involved with a large eu program called nanoland um and but i think there's a system that could be engineered to, to manage that particularly if you're looking at waters and you've got the materials you know I mean, a lot of those emerging contaminants you find in water supplies and things don't you so yeah, yeah. i don't think it's beyond the the imagination of a good engineer to, to contain those sorts of systems and come up with a robust system that would work. But yeah, I think that's a great idea to get into. Great area. Other questions? I, I actually, I might ask one more if I could. Um, I just wondered, you, you, you've, you guys have been working in the, in the area of net radionuclide remediation for, for long enough now to have probably seen some interesting changes with respect to Geomicrobiology, I guess, how, how you think about the application of geomicro to radionuclides or what challenges have emerged? Or I, I wonder if, if you can talk a little bit about that. Like in your experience, has how did you sort of start looking at the idea of microbes involved in radionuclide immobilization or remediation? And then where have you kind of come from there? Has it changed much? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it has. I mean, I... So my, my background was in sort of more conventional biotechnology, to be honest. And then I, I, I worked with um, Lynn McCaskey, who some of you all know, in, in, in the 90s when I started my postdoc work. And, and it was to work on um, a, a rather odd idea at the time to try and find organisms that could reduce uranium, plutonium, neptunium. And... Um, it was funded by BNFL and, and, and government. It was, it, it, you know, it, it was, it was wacky enough. I thought that'd be quite a fun thing to do. And I had a few people warn me against doing it. So there's, there's a reason nobody's doing that work. It's not been done before because it's a, you know, it's some, you know, it's not going to be important. Don't waste your time on that. So I, you know, I, I just thought it was kind of cool. You know, you're looking at substrates that organisms have never seen. Technetium was in there. You know, it doesn't exist naturally. You know, it's only, it would only be there because we put it there. So you're looking at completely artificial elements. Um, and then when I got into it, I guess it, the timing was fantastic because DOE had started to pump money into the neighbor program. Um, the Genomes to Life program, which I guess was the first program, big program around environmental genomics, which I know, Johnny, you, you're very familiar with from your, your time in the US. I mean, that, to be honest, they, they did a tremendous service to the GMICO community. And I think the environmental microbiology community in general so with these tremendous advances through through those programs and a lot of that kind of focused on the work at the rifle site that, that, that i mentioned um so i think it put it on the map you know i mean i in the uk then i i was working with some people in nuclear um but I, you know unless you've started to see published work and people are understanding it and and, you, and you've got something to get a bit of traction with the engineers and the site license folks and things. It's very difficult to get going. But I, you know, then I did that secondment into um, 
the nuclear nuclear sector through the Royal Society Fellowship, which if anyone's looking for a, <laughs> some a way to support some time in industry and even academic or, or going the other way, look at those, they're fantastic. And then, you know, once you get embedded into that community, then then they do start, you know, they, they start, you know, um, you know, absorbing those ideas and seeing, seeing how important they could be. So I think things have changed. I think there's a lot of interest in it. In all honesty, I, I think a lot of it actually is around understanding the natural processes and tweaking them a little bit, if you can. And really, I mean, for somewhere like Sellafield, a lot of it's kind of understanding natural attenuation as well and feeding in some of this information so they can understand what's happening at, at the site. And then if there's something that they think won't be dealt with through natural attenuation, coming up with the solutions for them to, to try and, you know, tweak that that process, that biogeochemical process to, to mobilise the, the RADs. But it's a slow old business, you know, nothing happens quickly in nuclear. You've got long half-lives and you've got difficult sites. And, and But I think the culture's there, you know, the people now in, in nuclear understand this as something that's quite important. And, you know, the, the whole GDF thing, you know, that, that, that came really forward over the last I mean people have known about it, they've talked about it, but there's been a step change in understanding and and, and a realization that actually this could be important and it could be useful for them as well. So, you know, if, if I had to sum sum it up, I think for me the you know the applications take a long time to work through. But there's been a change in culture and the, the I think the people in those industries are very accepting now that microbiological processes are important and, and those dialogue the dialogue's much easier now and the funding's in place to to help that work move forward but it's a long job you know these these they're grand challenges those programs are going to run for decades and i think it's about feeding in the microbiology at the appropriate time but there's tons of opportunities and it's mirrored in all those net zero areas as well you know you'll know from the uk geos you know they embedded microbiology in there early on so they've got people taking samples from microbiologists properly you know so that we can work with them um, so, so I, you know, I think this is becoming much more mainstream and getting built into programs now, which was, which was a major hindrance previously. Yeah, that's great, John. Thank, if we can take on your experience as, I guess, a bit of advice to geomicrobiologists to, to be a bit bold in their thinking, creative and persistent, I guess, above all. And then I guess, but that's probably a good, good point to end on. <laughs> so well, thank you again for a great talk today great. and thank everyone for turning out. And just a quick plug for a couple of weeks, please come back to, uh, to catch Dr. Ashish Malik from uh, Aberdeen University, who will be taking us from, I guess, the deeper subsurface back up to that uh, bio rind that you described early on in your, your talk, John, about the active uh, um, microbial community in the soils and carbon cycling. So um, please join us again in a couple of weeks for Ashish's talk. And let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much, John, for, for speaking to us today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, John.